Well, we have here uh, another part of uh, Isaiah's prophecy. And, uh, of course, we are uh, reading Isaiah's uh, prophecy kind of a few thousand years after it was written, kind of two and a half thousand years there or thereabouts, after it was first written. And uh, really, we've got to say that us tonight meeting in 2022 in Clidach are not really what Isaiah and who Isaiah had in mind as he is penning what he penned all those many years ago. He has, of course, in mind, uh, as the Holy Spirit is, uh, is giving him the words to, to write through his, his penship and through his hand and his mind, but he is thinking of Israel, isn't he? Because as uh, prophets, as in prophecy here is given, there is a, an immediate uh, meaning, there is an immediate audience, there is an immediate kind of target. And, and it is a bit like uh, walking in North Wales. If you've ever walked Snowdon or some of the... I, th I think in, in South Wales, we kind of have rolling kind of hills, don't we? You don't have to go far before you're either going uphill or downhill. But in North Wales, what I find whenever I go to North Wales, it's very flat... And then you get these big mountains, and it's kind of flat again. But you have kind of mountains in North Wales, whereas we tend to have kind of lumps and bumps and hills, don't we? Well, it's a bit like that looking at prophecy. You look at a, a mountain, perhaps you go to North Wales or the Alps, or you watch the Tour de France or something on TV, and you see there a, a hill, a mountain in front of you. And it's there in front of you, you can see some of the detail, and it's big, and, and everything else, you see good, the outline. But then behind that, you see a, a bigger mountain, and you can't quite see, because the one mountain's in front, you can't quite see what's in between, but because this mountain is bigger, you can see it, and you certainly see the outline, and you see some of the detail. And then beyond that, there's a third mountain, even larger, huge. But of course, it's in the distance, and... Again, you can't see what's between the, the second and the third mountain. You don't get that perspective. You can't see quite how far away it is, but you see the outline, certainly from where you are. And prophecy can be a bit like that. Isaiah, as he writes, and the other uh, prophets, as they're writing, that immediate first mountain, in a sense, is their immediate audience of the Israelites. These are things that are going to happen. Things like Babylon and Cyrus the king, who... Uh, let them go, and, and things like that. That's the immediate mountain. And the prophecy is about that. But it's about more. There's a second greater mountain. And the saviour, the servant, the Messiah, is going to come. And there's detail there, isn't there? And you can see it, but you can't see what's in between. You don't know how far away. And then there's a third mountain. Again, far away. Less detail, because it's in the distance which is, as they prophesy, they're looking forward to the second coming of Christ. Bit of an outline. But you can't see the real detail. More of it, of course, in, in Revelation. But in the prophets, that's what they do. They have an immediate audience, as it were, first hearers. Then there's more meaning, more depth to the meaning. Or heights, whichever way you look at it, I guess. Um, and, and as the first readers, the first hearers of Isaiah's prophecy, they would have thought that the servant that is mentioned here was a purified Israel. The immediate, I mean, as sinners, we always think everything we hear is about us, don't we? Uh, it was very interesting seeing the crowds gathering uh, in Buckingham Palace and all the different places. And, and, you know, the crowds interviewed, why did you come? Because I felt, because I wanted not really about the Queen then, it's really about you, isn't it? And I know what they meant. I wanted to pay my respects. I still really don't know what that means. Uh, but I wanted to do this. I felt that I should. We move everything to us, don't we? And the Israelites are doing that. They're seeing this. And they are, of course, in Babylon. They are the remnant. They're being purified. And they think that the servant is going to be a purified version of Israel. 
But of course, the problem of Israel will always be the same. Disobedience. They're sinners. Look at verse 2 for a moment. When I came, why was there no one? When I called, why was there no one to answer? Was my arm too short to deliver you? Do I lack the strength to rescue you? Where were you? Have you been listening? What's going on? That's what God is calling. They're disobedient. That's what Israel is like. That's what Israel has always been like. That's why a greater servant is needed. It's why no servant in Israel is good enough. It's why great David's greater son is needed. And so we see here in this third servant song that we've been considering this month that the servant here will be obedient to the will of God, even to the point of suffering. And the, the song that we're considering about the servant is found uh, in chapter 50, in verses 4 to 9 specifically. Uh, and then you get in verses 10 and 11 the kind of the, the correct responses or the different responses to the servant. And these verses 4 to 9 are the servant speaking in the first person. So this is God the Son, the servant speaking here. And the first thing we see is, is that the servant is a student. We see that he's a, a student. I always think one of the mind-blowing things about Jesus, the creator and sustainer of life, the head of creation, as Colossians 1 puts it, is that he is a child in Nazareth. I nearly said Bethlehem. He was a baby in Bethlehem, but he's a child in Nazareth. And he's growing up and he is learning as every other child is. That, I, my head can't cope with that, in a sense. He's the head of creation, and yet he's learning to become a carpenter. And he's learning this, that, and the other. But look here. The servant is a student. He's learning here. Verse 4. The sovereign Lord has given me a well-instructed tongue to know the word that sustains the weary. He wakens me morning by morning, wakens my ear to listen like one being instructed. Sovereign Lord has opened my ears. You see what's happening here? Sometimes we, we call people, don't we, well-spoken. And sometimes we call them well-spoken. Nobody's ever said that about me, I don't think. But well-spoken because they've got that accent, you know, the kind of the, the cut glass or whatever it is. I can do it if I try for a few seconds, uh, possibly. Uh, but they've got that accent. But we also use the phrase well-spoken for people who are eloquent. The words that they use. Some people are eloquent. They are well-spoken. Some people you can listen to and they can be talking about the most boring subject in the world. But the language that they use and perhaps the enthusiasm or whatever it is, well, they're well-spoken. They draw you in. But we've got something far more than that here. This is a well-instructed tongue, verse 4, because it is eloquent, not in the words that is used, but the tongue is eloquent in the word of God. That's what we see here. Well-instructed tongue to know the word that sustains the weary. We saw uh, a Two weeks ago, when we were looking at chapter 42, that the Spirit of God was upon Jesus. And of course, when we're thinking of the life and the work of the Lord Jesus, we know that Jesus was filled to the absolute brim with the Spirit. Because he's not a sinner, Jesus is filled in a way that we cannot be. And here we see the effect that the Spirit has. The, the effect is, he wakens me morning by morning, wakens my ear to listen like one being instructed. That's the effect of the Spirit. He has a, that overwhelming desire each and every morning to be in the Word. And we know from the Gospel accounts, don't we, that Jesus, when he comes, used to withdraw regularly. We're told there to pray. It's the prompting of the Spirit of God upon him to, to encourage him to do that. The Sovereign Lord has opened his ears. He wakens me morning by morning. This is the servant speaking. It is the Sovereign Lord who has given him a well-instructed 
tongue. You see, we've got to think about who teaches us. I, I watched the film Dead Poet Society uh, a few weeks ago. I haven't seen it. I don't think I've ever seen it. It's a story of Robin Williams, the actor, being, uh, playing a, a great kind of teacher, inspiring, basically, the students to read great works of literature. And sometimes you, you can, I can remember back a, a maths teacher that I had who inspired me to work a bit harder, or to actually do any work, unlike some of the other teachers. And the way that he did it was this. If you can get this sum correct, and I was about 13 or 14, if you can get this sum correct, you can have, and he put money like a 50 pence piece, first one to get this right. I found that very inspiring. I don't think I ever got the money, but it was very inspiring. Great teachers inspire us, don't they? It is the Holy Spirit who is the greatest teacher ever. It is the Holy Spirit who encourages us, encourages us to look to the, the greatest, the word of God. That's the thing. And here we have, in, this, in, the, in the unity of the Godhead, God is instructing the Son of God, the servant. God, by his Spirit, is teaching the young Jesus. It's remarkable, and in many ways, it's mind-blowing. And if Jesus here, or the servant, to be more accurate here, who is Jesus, but the servant here, if he is well instructed, and if he is a student, how much more do we need to be students of the word of God? And we have, of course, the completed work of, of Scripture. The Lord Jesus, when he comes, has got the Old Testament, but we have the Gospels as well, and we have the Epistles, and Revelation. And Revelation. We've got the whole of the New Testament, the whole of the Word of God, all of it given to us for our instruction, for our help to make us the people that God wants us to be. And we need to be students, just like the Lord Jesus. And so we need to be in his word, don't we? The question is this, do you read scripture? Or do you read scripture? And sometimes, you, I'm sure you know what it's like, you can read scripture, you can read a chapter, and then you can go back like 30 seconds later. What did I read then? Because your mind is gone. There's reading and there's reading, isn't there? Problem is we get weary. Verse 4. The Sovereign Lord has given me a well-instructed tongue to know the word that sustains the weary. We can feel weary, can't we? But it is the word that we need in those times to sustain us. And the, it's the word and the spirit together. The spirit here, and we see the spirit's instruction here upon the servant. And, and really the work of the, the spirit upon us, awakening our souls and sustaining us in the word. The word and the, and the spirit together. Well, the spirit is a student. Second thing we see is the servant is obedient. This is the main thrust really of these verses. See it in verse 5. The sovereign Lord has opened my ears. I have not been rebellious. I have not turned away. Well, of course he hasn't. And he, of course he doesn't. But of course the contrast is what is important here in this passage. Because it is the contrast here with what goes before. Verse 2, speaking of Israel, when I come came, why was there no one? When I called, why was there no one to answer? Was my arm too short to deliver you? Do I lack the strength to rescue you? Why are you looking elsewhere, in other words? Why are you so disobedient? Do I have me a rebuke? I can dry up seas, turn rivers into deserts, and, and everything else. I can, all those, uh, those foreign countries who are trying to destroy you, who are judging you, you didn't trust me to keep your security. You didn't treat me as a refuge. Instead, you turned away to Ashtoreths and Moloch and Baal and everything else, and you wanted a king to be like the other countries, and you looked everywhere else apart from looking to the living God, who is able. His arm is not shortened that it cannot save. Arm is not too short to deliver you. He closed the heavens. 
And that's the contrast with the one who comes, who I have not been rebellious, I have not turned away. And it's that he listens, as we have seen to the word of God. He is listening, but he is obedient as well. You know, sometimes you see someone, perhaps you're shopping, and you're halfway through the shop, and you can see somebody in another aisle, and you're kind of in a bit of a rush, or you're in a bad mood, or you just don't want to speak to them. You don't want to see them, and you think, oh, all right. If they go up that aisle, I'll have to go down the other aisle, I'll have to go the other way. And you do your best to kind of avoid them. You can ignore them, can't you? You don't have to see them. Or sometimes you know news is coming and you don't want to hear that news. So you kind of turn away so that you, you don't listen to the news that you just don't want. You know the bad news is coming. And you try and turn away. You stop listening. I was going to say, I used to have a sister. I still have a sister. But when we were young, if we argued, she would kind of scream in my face. It's probably slightly one-sided uh, argument. But she would scream in my face as far as I was concerned. And then as soon as I tried to argue back, she'd stick her fingers in her ears. Very annoying. Especially when she was about 25. She wasn't really. Uh, but it's very annoying, isn't it? But that's what we can kind of do. Especially when we know bad news is coming. We don't want to listen. We turn away. Jesus, in his obedience, deliberately listens. He doesn't turn his back. He doesn't hide away. He deliberately listens to all of his father's will for him and obeys at all time. There's a sense in which instead of turning away from that news or that, the will of God, he is turning towards that in a way that we just so often don't. And he obeys at all times. I have not been re rebellious. I have not turned away. You know, we are... We are disobedient, aren't we? That's what we're like as sinners. Because the great news of the gospel is, is that we're not reliant upon our obedience. We're reliant upon his obedience. And the servant is obedient. I have not been rebellious. Well, the third thing we see is that the servant is obedient in suffering. And you see it in verse 6. I have not been rebellious. I have not turned away. Here comes the bad news in a sense. I offered my back to those who beat me. You see, even in suffering, Jesus is obedient. Not just in day-to-day -day living for his father, but also when he's called to suffer. When the really bad news comes. I offered my back to those who beat me, my cheeks to those who pulled out my beard. Can't imagine how much that must hurt. I did not hide my face from mocking and spitting. He's called to suffer. And he's obedient in all points of the law. He's obedient in everything that he does, including knowing that he's going to have to suffer. And we see it often when Jesus tells his disciples about his future. And he often uses the kind of the same phrase, or the, the, the New Testament, the Gospel writers use the, name phrase, uh, the same phrase. Uh, Jesus told them that he would have to suffer, die, and then rise again. And uh, disciples often forget that until after he's risen again, don't they? But we can forget as well, because often we miss out the suffer part. Yes, the die and rise again, but that's not what the word says. It so often says he had to suffer, die, and rise again. And we miss out the suffering part. But we're reminded in Scripture, aren't we, that Jesus' back is scourged. And this is the prophecy here of, of Jesus beating. The shame of the Roman soldiers beating him, mocking him, spitting him. I, I saw it, I watched, I was never sure, and I didn't watch it in the cinema. But remember the film in the 90s, oh gosh, a long time ago, 1990s. Uh, is it The Passion of the Christ, Mel Gibson's film? And uh, the big thing that it misses out, of course, it misses out kind of God's wrath upon him and, and the... the, the the fact that he is abandoned by God, and that's what it really misses out. But in the physical suffering, it, it shows his scourging. It shows his suffering before he goes to the cross. And I, and I didn't know whether to watch it or not, and in the end, I kind of did at home. And, uh, 
it was okay, but, but I really picked up on that. We kind of lose that. I offered my back to those who beat me, my cheeks to those who pulled out my beard. The one who is the head of all creation is humiliated and beaten by Roman soldiers. And as well, I did not hide my face from mocking and spitting. He deliberately turns his face towards Jerusalem, doesn't he? That's the way it's described. He turns towards Jerusalem and he knows what's coming. He knows the beard, the back. He knows the cross. He knows his future, but he deliberately sets his face towards Jerusalem. He doesn't hide away in the way that we hide in Tesco's or whatever. And we're just hiding from a, an awkward conversation for a minute. He is not hiding away from suffering in this way. Well, we will see more of that suffering next week, God willing, when we look at the final servant song. But the fourth thing we see is that the servant is helped and is vindicated, which is very important. And we see it in verses 7 and 9, or 7 to 9 rather. Verse 7, because the sovereign Lord helps me, I will not be disgraced. Therefore, I have set my face like flint. I know I will not be put to shame. He who vindicates me is near. Who then will bring charges against me? Let us face each other. Who's my accuser? Let him confront me. You see here, we're, we're seeing here the fact that the, the servant, when he comes, is going to be sinless. Let the accuser come. He's got nothing to accuse him of. There's nothing to kind of hang his hat on to go for him. There's no accusations that can be made. The accuser can't accuse him. And think about that for a moment. In the, uh, in the wilderness when Jesus uh, is there and he is weak, uh, he hasn't uh, eaten or drunk for all those days, and, and then Satan comes to him and bombards him with, uh, with uh, those temptations which were tempting to Jesus, otherwise they're not temptations, so they are really tempting, they really are. But the, accu the accuser as he comes, remember those temptations. There's no accusation about Jesus' sin at all. The, the, first, uh, the first temptation about bread basically is accusing God, the Father, isn't it? If you're really the son of God, why are you hungry? Does your father really care for you? I can say this. I was trying to work out if I could say this, but I can. Uh, I was in prison, uh, as I always am, but I was in prison over the weekend. Somebody knew in, unusual surname, and uh, that's as far as I can say. And, uh, and I went back to him and said, did you have a daughter called? And he said, yes, I did. That's my daughter. I said, oh, she was in school with one of my daughters. The thing that I remember about that little girl, the only reason I can remember her name is because when she was five or six, she used to steal other people's food out their bags. That reflects on him and the mother, doesn't it? Why? She's hungry. She's got no food. She's not cared for. I didn't accuse him. I said, oh, very good. You know, the late 20s or whatever now. Uh, but I thought afterwards, you know, all those years ago, that little girl stealing food because she's hungry. I could accuse him of that. That's the accusation, isn't it? In the, in the wilderness, with the temptation. Why are you hungry, Jesus? Well, there's a particular purpose. Of course there is. But that's what he's trying to do. But he doesn't accuse Jesus, does he? Who is my accuser? Let him bring charges. He can't. The accuser can't accuse Jesus of anything. He tries to drive a, a wedge between the father and the son there in the wilderness, but he can't accuse Jesus because he's sinless. And he is vindicated as well. But when does the vindication come, of course? Well, I had a, a friend who was a pastor many years ago, and uh, he was told a secret, quite an important secret, Something had happened to somebody, and um, it, it was a fairly serious thing. And, uh, but he was told, you must not tell anyone. So my friend, the pastor, didn't tell anyone. And that cost him. 
because the news came out, the family, the way the family got to hear and, and everything else. And, and basically, this, my friend suffered as a result. He was never vindicated. And he had to keep the secret because he promised. Even though it meant for him that his reputation went a little bit. He's still a pastor, but, but kind of miles away. But his, his reputation suffered as a result, but he couldn't break the promise. He couldn't. And he was never vindicated. It's hard to do, isn't it, when perhaps you've got to keep a promise and you're accused of something and you can't be vindicated. The only vindication is to break the promise. It's the only way. And your pride is screaming out, isn't it? Defend yourself. Break the promise. Say something. It's so hard to do, isn't it? Where's the vindication of Jesus, the servant? Resurrection, ascension, second coming, when we're all in glory. The rewards for Jesus is the church, isn't it? The reward, the great reward for the servant here. His great vindication day will be the most amazing party there will ever be an eternity, the marriage supper of the Lamb. There's the vindication day. There's when everything that he has done, that day, and the precursor to it in a sense, Philippians 2, we're reminded there, weren't we? There's a day coming, every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess. He will be vindicated. People will see him as he is. He truly is. Well, the fifth thing, final thing, and very briefly we'll see, the servant deserves a response. Uh, and so we get that servant song in verses 4 to 9, and then in verses 10 and 11, uh, we get the responses, or the responses, I should say, because the servant deserves a response because of his obedience, because of his obedience in suffering and everything else. And you see in verse 10, who among you fears the Lord, obeys the word of his servant, the call is, the question is quite simple, isn't it? How are we to respond to the servant, fear the Lord, obey his word? And do it in the light. And again, we get Gentile hope here. Let the one who walks in the dark, who has no light, trust in the name of the Lord and rely on their God. That's what the servant's going to do so we can. If you've got uh, children or grandchildren, you've seen the film Toy Story. Towards the end, Buzz Lightyear is kind of on the run. And there's one of those uh, grab machines. Remember the grab, uh, grab machines? They're still around, aren't they? In kind of arcades and, and things. And you put money in. And then the arm goes down the grabber. And it grabs something. And then it kind of draws you in. And then it drops it. And you get nothing. And then you put more money in. Well, you don't and I don't. But silly people do. They put more money in and it grabs nothing. Well, in, in Toy Story... There's the, the aliens, the little green aliens. And they're looking up. And they're looking towards the light. And they keep saying, follow the light, follow the light. Go for the grabber. One of them hangs on to the grabber in the end. Follow the light. Like a moth. I mean, moths are mentioned here. All you who light fires, provide yourself with flaming torches. Go to the light. Be like that moth that goes to the light that flees towards it. That's the correct response. That's how we are to respond to the servant, to go to the light of the world. In worship, in adoration, in love, in obedience, even when we're weary, as we saw right at the beginning, we go to the one who can give us rest. Because it's hard work, isn't it, groping in the darkness? It really is. Listening to something earlier about about um, about the world, something was a very good um, uh, thing I was listening to, uh, and I can't remember the people involved. So uh, if I remember afterwards, you can you can ask me. Uh, but uh, one of them was saying this that he was a chaplain or working uh, in the Dominican Republic, I think, with people who had been trafficked out of Haiti, and he said there was these people who had suffered terribly, no hint, no talk of suicide there. But he said he was preaching. It was an American guy who was preaching in I think Northern Ireland talking to people there, suicide, so much, everything that the world offers, entertained 
24 hours a day and, and all the, that the world offers in that way, the world, but in darkness, groping. Nothing, no meaning in life. Taking their own lives. It's darkness, isn't it? Groping in the dark is tiring. We need rest. And it is in the light of the Lord Jesus Christ that we find. That we trust in the name of the Lord. We rely upon God. But verse 11 gives us human attempts to get rid of darkness. All you who light fires, provide yourself with flaming torches. Go walk in the light of your fires, the torches you have set ablaze. This is what you shall receive from my hand. You lie down in torment. Bringing your own light brings disaster. Sometimes you can kind of have a, a light party. Bring a light, bring a torch. Brings disaster when it comes to the gospel. No, we come to the one who is the light of the world. But the one who walks in the light, who has no light, trust in the name of the Lord. He's the one who gives meaning and purpose and truth because he is the light of the world and he's the servant who is obedient even to the point of death.